in radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. The date is May 24th, 2016. Hard to believe this year is going to be half over soon, but the economic mayhem, the economic dislocations, chaos continues onward unabated. And you're definitely familiar with Chris Martinson, his site, peakprosperity.com. And Chris, I mean, you've written, you've been prolific about the entire crisis, your latest book called Prosper, which uh, you were kind enough to provide me with a copy, really has a vision for the future. And we're really happy to have you back on the show. Well, thank you, Kerry. It's good to be back with you and all your listeners. So we're at the point now with the EU of deja vu all over again, as Yogi Berra like to Mm -hmm. say. I mean, didn't I thought they fixed the Greek problem. What's going on here? (laughs) <laughs> well, they did in the sense that they don't write about it and put it in the newspapers as much as they used to. And financial markets used to be fixated on what was happening in Greece, uh, but no longer fixate. You could uh, have the worst headlines in the world about Greece and uh, and the financial markets won't care because the idea, which I think is a false one, is that the whole Greek problem has been contained. The taxpayers in EU are completely on the hook. The French and German banks are off the hook. But what we're seeing now, Kerry, is that uh, the IMF, which can do math, basic math, has uh, (laughs) run a few pencils across a couple napkins and said, oh my gosh, there is no circumstance under which Greece can possibly repay any of its debt under the terms as they exist. So there's a schism finally opening up between what the German banks want and what the IMF wants. Both of them are still on the hook for parts of this. And so the IMF, get this, they come out and they said, listen, we have a plan. And under our plan, we think Greece could meet the terms of paying back its debt. Here's term one. They don't start paying anything back until the year 2040. Ah. Here's term two. They get until they get to until 2080 to pay back what they currently <laughs> I owe. Saw that, yeah. Term three, <laughs> one and a half percent interest. Wow. Right? Um, but all of that left unsaid for the astute listener is: wait a minute, that works if and only if Greece has the money to pay it back. What did the IMF have to assume? And of course, they had to assume rapid resumption of GDP growth somewhere in there so that Greece can crawl its way out of this. Now, let's remember, the IMF is the perennially Pollyannish organization that every year forecasts Greece is just about to start (laughs) returning to economic growth. It's been doing this every year reliably uh, since 2010, uh, 2009, when when the crisis started. And they've been so wrong that their forecast in 2010 called for Greece's economy to be 32 percent bigger than it is this year in 2015, it's last year. Right. So they only they only whiffed by a third on that, uh, on that. and <laughs> they're going to keep whiffing because the austerity is killing Greece. Ten thousand businesses closed mm. this year. Mm. Over two hundred and fifty thousand businesses closed since the start of the crisis. It's just getting worse. It's it's just shocking. Uh, Greece. All right, they've always had economic challenges, but there was a vibrancy there and. People, uh, they weren't living on the streets. They're in a major, full-scale, unabated depression right now, Chris. I mean, it's a depression. Half the people are unemployed or a huge percentage. Well, even during the Great Depression, uh, we didn't find that the country was also saddled with a huge influx of highly disruptive, highly needy refugees who are bringing a lot of troubles, uh, uh, you know, a lot of need needs and neediness, which of course all refugees would have. And they're bringing in culture shock as well. And Greece, of course, is on the front line of that sticking all the way out into the Mediterranean as it does. It's one of the logical first places for boats to land. And uh, Brussels has said, yeah, thanks. You got to take all those people. Uh, No money for you. (laughs) Why don't you deal with that too? Oh, that's great. Yeah. So uh, as if they didn't have enough problems already, Chris, they're they're saddled with the refugee, the so-called refugee crisis. Which, again, just to be fair, is almost entirely a a NATO 
created monster where guess what if mm-hmm. you bomb people uh, some of them are going to want to leave the uncertainty and the death and destruction of of that policy behind and uh, nato absolutely is up to its eyebrows in creating the instability in the regions where many of these people yeah. are fleeing uh, and of course not all of them come from syria of course many people are coming from afghanistan which i would include in the nato disaster list i would include uh, pakistan as well But a lot of people from North Africa, Libya, of course, escaping a NATO disaster, Uh, the rest of them varying degrees of both NATO led disasters and ecological and uh, uh, economic uh, sort of migrant status, like wanting to leave areas which are not that supportive uh, for a variety of reasons. So it's it's really, Carrie. I think that this refugee thing is tip of the iceberg, but there's poor Greece struggling at the front lines of it. And one more statistic on Greece, out of 220 billion euros of internal loans held by their banks in the country, at last count, 119 billion of those, more than half, were non-performing loans. So I don't care what kind of pencil or crayon you use. The, it, Greece just doesn't have the math doesn't work, period. Mm-hmm. Doesn't work. So the, so the IMF said, not only let's kick the can, but let's put a rocket booster on it and send it out towards the next century. You think <laughs> we could do that? <laughs> hey, well, you know, during the mortgage crisis, I remember this guy who I worked with, he showed me an offer that he had from one of the banks to restructure his his mortgage. And what you were describing reminds me almost exactly what the bank offered. And they were going to stretch out the term of the loan to 40 years from 30. And they were going to only charge him 2% interest on the uh, property. And they weren't even, they were, weren't even going to add his delinquencies to the principal and the modification, nothing like that. They were just going to do that. Uh, I told them he should definitely do it uh, because his monthly payment on his home would be less than anything he could rent. However, the uh, problem was he was going through a divorce and the ex-wife or soon to be ex would never agree to it. So that was the end of that. But it really reminded me of exactly the same thing as the mortgage crisis. But to going on, um, we're going to talk about oil, but I don't think you can really talk about oil without talking about what's happening in uh, Venezuela. Uh because they're just a little more advanced down the uh, slippery slope than than Greece. Well, indeed, you know, Venezuela is suffering itself from a, a number of self-imposed problems uh, and predicaments as well. And uh, their basic one, which I, I had a wonderful interview with Furful, um, oh, sure. uh, who, you, who you and your listeners are probably familiar with. He hails from Argentina, expatted. He's currently living in, in Spain, Spain. But I got him right. to talk to me about what's going on in Venezuela. And he said, ah, Chris, it's, it, it starts and, and almost ends with corruption. It, it's a corrupt nation. And when corrupt nations uh, get to do what they do, it doesn't matter that, that Venezuela has the second largest stated oil reserves in the world or that they've got abundant natural resources. They, they've got the, all the pieces for something other than the world they're living in. And the world they're living in is in a state of collapse right now. Collapse is the right word for this. Morgues are overflowing. Food is in short supply. People are beginning to literally starve. Uh, they, they have no money. It's just a mess, right? But it really began and ended with corruption. And I, I would hope that people listening to this would understand that it's never okay to look past a little corruption. You know, it, it, it's a slippery slope. And I think we're on our own because I could easily describe the political process in the United States is finally having been revealed to more people, hopefully a critical oh, yes. mass, is also being founded pretty principally on the idea of corruption. And, uh, and, and that should not be tolerable to people who value liberty, security, peace, and not being uh, shafted on a routine basis. But uh, so yes, Venezuela to me is very much a uh, poster child for what can go wrong and what it'll look like if it does. And yeah, the U.S. uh, being one gigantic kleptocracy, that's become quite obvious. But really, it's every country in the world here, Chris. The corruption has way, way overran the ability of the real economy of you and I to produce and support it. It's become unsustainable. And look, corruption is nothing new. I remember in college, I took a course in international trade, which is a great course teacher was really in the thick of it and the most corrupt ports okay because the insurance industry rates seaports for corruption the most corrupt port in the world was caracas venezuela that was 40 years ago and number two was like lagos uh nigeria 
and you just went down the list. And those are the countries that are the most screwed up. So as corrupt as the U.S. is, at least with containerization, most of the uh, freight gets delivered <laughs> to where it's going. But when you <laughs> send it to Caracas, it's a black hole. And oh, yeah. you just can't get the stuff there without paying protection to get it, get it protected. Absolutely. And, and I think you made a, a great point with that. And also earlier when you said, look, corruption has always been with us. And guess what? It'll always be with us. I think um, there is no particular ism. Uh, I, sometimes I hear people sort of almost get utopian about whatever ism they like, whether it's libertarianism or socialism or capitalism or whatever, as if somehow those by themselves are systems that could correct for human hardwiring and software. Nothing so far has been immune to the fact that if people aren't held accountable, they will do wacky stuff. Um, and, and that's just part of it. And so really, it's the lack of accountability and growing lack of accountability that bothers me. And here's what I don't know, Kerry, is that just spreading as it always does late stage in any ism or, or system? Or does the internet just help us become more aware of it? But I'm aware now that it feels to me like almost everything I look at is corrupt at this point in time. And I hope that doesn't sound too cynical and jaded. But you know, when I peel back the covers, that's what I see. Like yesterday's ruling, or was it the day before that Bank of America hadn't actually committed fraud, according to a judge who overturned an entire jury verdict all on his own decided that nah, that wasn't fraud, because fraud has this sort of a definition to it. But everything that that uh, Countrywide did in misrepresenting those loans to sell them back to Fannie and Freddie was absolutely fitting every definition of fraud of which I'm aware, but it doesn't matter because this judge had decided for himself and who knows what his incentives are. And of course, U.S. judges are never held accountable, whatever, no matter how ridiculous their decisions. So, so, but again, that's just a daily reminder. It's not like I'm going to pick on the Bank of America decision. I see stuff like that, Carrie, every day, 10 times a day if I go looking for it. Of course. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Um, there's a lot of reasons why corruption has increased. And I think the U.S. historically, up until the 50s, not that the corruption didn't exist and it was well hidden, granted, uh, was pretty clean. And over time, the wars... Uh, look, one of the biggest areas of corruption that really screws everybody is a thing like defense procurement or any government procurement. Uh, like what happens is uh, you have a fixed price contract. You're buying uh, 85,000 Humvees. It's fixed. But then you get your government, your friendly government procurement officer to put in a change order. And the change order is we're going to do change it from dark green to olive. And immediately a change order goes in, and that's the exception to the contracting process. And this was done extensively in World War II. I don't know that much about World War I, but in World War II, extensively, Korean War, forget it, Vietnam War, and every war since then. And these change orders are where they steal and get the bulk of their profits. And that is out of hand and it's extended over to all areas of government procurement and in fact there was just a study put out and i can't remember by whom but i will look it up and post it on the site so look for it on uh, financial survival network.com i'll send you a link it said under obama the amount of fraud and waste in the government has gone to nearly 20 percent of expenditures that they can figure out these are the uh, inspector generals of the various departments. 20% of expenditures is going out the door for fraud here, Chris. And uh, that's just what's reported, what's known. So it's not hard to envision that half the money goes to Washington is being wasted. Yeah. And, and uh, that's just the money that goes to Washington. Of course, there's the oh, other money yeah. that's just printed out of thin air and handed to Washington. And of course, mm -hmm. of course. So here's the idea. Um, uh, corruption is, is not this exception that we have to be vigilant for. It's the rule that you have to be uh, systematically prepared for. It just exists. And that's the thing that really caught me off guard, whether it was the Bush administration or Obama, or I'm sure whoever is in office next, was that the real criminals, the real big players were never held accountable. And of course, if they're not held accountable, 
They'll keep doing what they do. And even when people are held accountable, they'll keep doing what they do. I mean, look at there are countries where if you commit adultery, you get stoned to death. Now, that's a pretty steep price to pay. And it still happens. Right. So Mm -hmm. so the penalties themselves are are not necessarily even themselves going to be a guarantee of anything. But when you have a system with no penalties and outrageous rewards, Welcome to the world we currently live in. You, this should not be a surprise to anybody listening. I don't think. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And corruption, um, it gravitates to the top. But I think that through policies that were created over the years, war on drugs, our tax policy, uh, so many others, criminalization of activities that were never held to be criminal before, Overcriminalization diminishes respect for the law and for the laws that are actually positive and makes people not comply. When they pass an assault rifle ban or registration requirement in New York State that all of a sudden turns uh, perhaps a couple million citizens into criminals, and then there's a 5% compliance rate, and you wonder why people don't respect the law anymore. It it uh, it's part of a pattern. Well, I don't respect the law anymore because law is is not a hard and fixed thing. It's a contract. It's an agreement, and so I will agree that it makes sense for me not to speed. And there's and there's some some penalties if I do. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I will agree to pay my taxes, and there'll be some penalties if I don't. Right. So so these are all agreements we have, but it gets hard to respect the law. When I see that people like Hillary Clinton apparently is getting away with things that other people got slammed for, which was being fast and loose with state secrets and confidential information. Now, I don't know if you've ever gone through this, but if you go through a security clearance process, there's some fairly serious documents you sign about what's going to how you're going to handle material. There's training around it. And of course, somebody in in government, as long as Hillary Clinton, obviously, is more steep in that than anybody I know. And, and to then plead ignorance and say, oh, I didn't know. Like, it just it's just ridiculous. And of course, you and I couldn't walk into a court of law and say, geez, I just didn't know that. Ignorance um, of the law is no ha- defense. <laughs> yeah, I, I did not know. I, God is my witness. I did not know that burning my neighbor's house down was was a wrong thing. Should I not have done that? I'm so sorry. Uh-huh. You know, <laughs> it's just it's ridiculous. So, yeah. But when Come we on. see that, we see the bankers get away with stuff. We see Eric Holden's Justice Department like. Oh you know, run the fast and furious program, but then nail marijuana growers to the wall. It's just ridiculous. There's no, there's no, uh, level setting, nothing. It makes sense. And, and so it it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. It's like watching Obama cry over the children lost at Sandy Hook yeah. and then continue the drone program uh, that includes weddings and schools all over the place with plenty of innocent people lost. So it, you know, he doesn't shed a single tear around that. So my point is morality either exists or it doesn't exist, right? It's not a conditional thing. Ah, it's Pakistani children. That they don't count, right? Either you care about children or you don't, period. Or and the law either is going to be followed or it's not. And guess what? The 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 rich and powerful have always had a slightly separate set of laws. But today, courtesy of the internet, we see just how dramatic that gap is right now. Oh yeah. It couldn't be any more perverse than it is today, Chris. And yeah, what you're saying about uh, one law for us, another law for them, it's it's clearly out of control. And until we do get control of it somehow, and I don't know how that's going to happen, um, really not much is going to change. And that's why, uh, hey, what do you do? How do you... uh, How do you uh, prepare yourself? How do you make yourself corrupt proof, uh, Chris? Well, you know, uh, to harken back to the Furful interview, I asked him, so if you're in Venezuela today, what do you do? And he said, you, 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 you do, you, you, you go back two more years and you leave. Right. Um, (laughs) And, uh, and so there's really, it, it, it becomes a problem though, when you look across the world and you ask yourself, well, you know, if I if I did want to live in a place where I could live in relative peace, security, freedom, and I don't want to live in a super corrupt place, uh, there are not that many places you could really point to and say there's a good one. I, I think there are pockets of exceptionalism in Europe. I think there's pockets of exceptionalism in the United States, but taken as a whole, uh, I'm not sure you can really um, apply those I- I- any longer. And so, 
uh, as far as I'm concerned, Europe is is in the in the throes of its the last bit of its unified experiment. Uh, I'm pretty sure the the Brexit, the British uh, Union leaving the European Union. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that they'll get a, a a no vote on that and stay and stay put in because yeah. of the amount of of lobbying and propaganda that's being levied. Reminds me of the Scottish referendum vote as well. Uh, they're pulling out all the stops, you know, it, it, top of the fold uh, opinion pieces in the Financial Times, BBC, you name it. Uh, the powers that be clearly want to stay in the union. That that makes sense. Uh, I don't think they'll get away with uh, voting out. But beyond that. When you look at just that statistic I said, where 119 billion in non-performing loans in the Greek banking system, okay, it's a complete disaster. What are you going to do? So Europe either bails that out, or there's a complete collapse of the banking system in Greece. Um, and if that happens, Italy's next, Spain is next, Portugal's next, on and on. Contagion. And I don't think it can hold. And then we have the refugee thing is is extra sand in the gearbox on all this. So uh, oh, that yeah. feels pretty tenuous to me at this point. Yeah, yeah. So. So get ready for the big bang, huh? Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, if if the, if in 2008 we had diagnosed this correctly and done a couple of structural reforms, it would have been painful but necessary. A couple of very big structural reforms. First of all, no such thing as too big to fail. Second of all, accountability comes back with a vengeance. Um, third of all, we have to we had to have recognized that you can't grow your credit instruments at twice the rate of your economy GDP. forever. Yeah. Right? You just can't do that. No. Right. But we said, no, nah, we're, we're going to keep trying that that model. This is different. So, <laughs> this time it's different, Chris. Yeah, Chris. no, well, no, it'll work this time. We just have to get the animal spirits going. We'll repair the credit <laughs> markets. But again, any sixth grader, Carrie, can tell you, you can't do that. You can't grow your debts at twice the rate of your income. It's mathematically no. Bankrupt is an idea, but that's what we're living under right now is a really bankrupt idea. And that's why people are mad. That's why they're upset. That's why they're anxious, even if they don't know exactly why. Hey, and as long as we're getting close to the topic, so election, I didn't really want to get into it, but we did talk about it last time. And uh, I like your your view on things. So we're, we're seeing Hillary Clinton's campaign literally implode before our very eyes. Of course, the media will not tell you that's happening, but it's happening for sure. Because look, Trump just secured the nomination literally two, two and a half weeks ago. He's already leading in numerous polls. So what is this telling you here um, about the turn that America is about to take? Well, what's even worse is that according to the polls I've seen, He's leading Hillary, but he's not leading Sanders. So the Democratic yeah, well, Party has a really big problem on its hands that it created. <laughs> couldn't happen to a yeah. nicer crew of people. Uh, nicer um, they crew did it to crux. themselves, right? But <laughs> they decided to try and elevate and promote a highly unelectable, corrupt, insincere individual. And uh, that's going to be a big problem for them because they, they it'll look real they'll have egg all over their faces. I don't think their egos could stand for it. But Sanders is probably the only person that that would make sense if you wanted to run a, a reasonable contest against Trump. Now, Trump just took off his gloves two days ago, I think. Yes, I don't know yes. if you saw it, but that. Oh, my goodness. I Ooh. watched the commercial. Yeah. Ooh, that is something, right? Well, uh, dredging up the, the thing that Vince the Foster campaign and never Vince... wanted to talk about. Oh, my gosh. The the, the rape charges and, and Vince Foster, Bill Clinton, Vince Foster, everything. I mean, my well, goodness. And it, it deserves to come up and out. It absolutely yeah. we deserve everything. It's fair to game. This. Everything's but the party fair. system always had said, we don't talk about stuff like that. That's impolite. Well, guess what? He's not polite. Fine. Um, yeah. This is going to he's going to destroy Hillary with her background. Yeah. Period. Well, Look, uh, this whole thing, um, you know, I don't want to get into all the scandals because there's so many of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, whatever Trump, whatever indiscretions he might have had in his life before, and look, to do construction in New York City, you got to deal with unsavory characters. But whatever he might have done wrong pales in comparison. And there's no way between you and I they're going to allow Bernie Sanders to get that nomination. They will not allow it here. They'll bring in Biden before that happens. They won't allow Bernie to do it. And I don't believe the polls that say Bernie's ahead. I think this is like a reaction to uh to him, you know, seeing the nomination stolen out from underneath him, you know. I can't oh, see him beating Trump. Absolutely, but why Trump. do you think they won't they won't allow him to to be nominated? 
Uh, because he's not really a Democrat. Number one, he's a, yeah. a Democrat socialist. Well, that's uh, but I repeat myself, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, the guy they can't get to him. You know, they're just never going to allow him. He's not a a loyal partyist, and they won't they won't allow him there. They will not. Just like they tried to stop Trump, opposite sides of the same coin. Um, he was just smarter than them. Bernie is not smarter than the uh, party elite for the most part. Well, I think Bernie um, uh, tried to play fair and nice and by the rules. And by yeah. the way, I mean, it's it's astonishing to me what Bernie has done. The fact that he's still packing stadiums to overflow capacity, 30,000 or yeah. more people. Democrats have never seen turnouts like that anywhere in their no. entire history. And uh, he's clearly galvanized a lot of young people who I think mm -hmm. have rightly, you know, moistened their finger, held it up and said the status quo is really working against my interests. I don't care what, you know, I have to yeah. do. I need non-status quo solution in there, which is exactly why if you ever went to a Ron Paul rally, you know, a number of years ago, you would see mm -hmm. the same thing. Like I the know. crowd is mostly 30 years old or younger for another old white guy, you know, like what is the, what's the, what's the message yeah. here? The message is young people can correctly see that they have nothing to gain and everything to lose by voting for the status quo. Yeah. And Hillary was making one more gasp, last gasp attempt to say, we boomers, you know, we've, we've messed everything up, but, but <laughs> we'll dang it, it we, we deserve to hold on to the brass ring, give it to us. It's ours. That entitled sense that I think really, um, and I'm part of this generation, I think really yeah, infects the both. generation. Uh, and, and it's, it's, it's both, it's, it's power and it's downfall. Both of us. Well, it just reminds me of that, uh, desperate, um, uh, campaign slogan of Jeb Bush's right before he dropped out. Jeb will fix it, you know, <laughs> Hillary will fix it, right? <laughs> yeah, like it just makes you laugh to even think about it, to think the that they're trying to sell you this. Uh, but we've got to wrap up now, Chris. So uh, best place to find you to buy your book and to to start getting on with it. Well, come on by peakprosperity.com. We've got a lot of content there. Great community. We're talking about all the different ways you can build capital in your life to be more resilient, happy, healthy, not just for whatever awkward future will probably arrive, but but today. Um, so it's uh, very much a, a wonderful community. So find us there and the book, you know, both my books can be found on Amazon, of course. Uh, last name is Martins and M-A-R-T-E-N-S-O-N. So go there or go peak prosperity. And we will have a link as always in the show notes to the interview to your site, to peakprosperity.com. Uh, make sure you go there, take a look. And I think you're really going to, to be impressed by the caliber, the quality, and the dedication that Chris puts into that site and his uh, frequent articles uh, really among the top on the internet. You know, Chris, one thing in the, in the uh, web is that the caliber and the quality of writing has deteriorated. Have you noticed that? You mean pretty much across the board? Or? Yeah, across the board, I find. Um, maybe it's because just anybody can write an article, but I found that hey, just typos are rampant in the most uh, prestigious of, um, you know, of, of uh, publications that would never allow a typo. And just the caliber of writing seems to really have have diminished uh, over time here. Well, yeah, I, I yeah, at the risk of sounding like another cranky old guy, but I agree. I agree. And, and I, I think it's part and parcel of the fact that that people uh, spend less time writing as they come up through school now. So we're, I think we're seeing yeah. a new crop of people who've not. To, it, it's a skill. It's a skill like judo. It takes time to learn how to get thoughts in your head unscrambled mm -hmm. and laid out neatly so somebody else can follow them. I'll tell you, Carrie, I, I, this past week alone, there were probably five times I caught myself having to reread a sentence four times and still yeah. not knowing what it meant. <laughs> oh, God, I know. I know exactly what you mean. And uh, it drives me a bit crazy to see it. Uh, it seems like writing, uh, effective writing as a medium of communication is is becoming a lost art. Let's hope that we can preserve it and uh, make it flourish uh, it's not easy to learn how to become an effective writer. I didn't do it until law school, honestly. I was lazy and just not versant in grammar. Combine lack of grammar with uh, with basically uh, lack of desire to 
to use this medium and you have where we are now. But in any event, you won't find that on peakprosperity.com and hopefully not on FSN either, although we repost other people's work. And Chris, we will talk to you again soon. And as always, uh, thank you for being on. It's been my pleasure, Carrie. Thank you. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. financialsurvivalnetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. The date is May 24th, 2016. Hard to believe this year is going to be half over soon, but the economic mayhem, the economic dislocations, chaos continues onward unabated. And you're definitely familiar with Chris Martinson, his site, peakprosperity.com. And Chris, I mean, you've written, you've been prolific about the entire crisis, your latest book called Prosper, which uh, you were kind enough to provide me with a copy, really has a vision for the future. And we're really happy to have you back on the show. Well, thank you, Kerry. It's good to be back with you and all your listeners. Hey, so we're at the point now with the EU of deja vu all over again, as Yogi Berra like to mm -hmm. say. I mean, didn't we, I thought they fixed the Greek problem. What's going on here? <laughs> well, they did in the sense that they don't write about it and put it in the newspapers as much as they used to. And financial markets used to be fixated on what was happening in Greece, uh, but no longer fixate. You could uh, have the worst headlines in the world about Greece and uh, and the financial markets won't care because the idea, which I think is a false one, is that the whole Greek problem has been contained. The taxpayers in EU are completely on the hook. The French and German banks are off the hook. But what we're seeing now, Kerry, is that uh, the IMF which can do math, basic math, has uh, <laughs> run a few pencils across a couple napkins and said, oh my gosh, there is no circumstance under which Greece can possibly repay any of its debt under the terms as they exist. So there's a schism finally opening up between what the German banks want and what the IMF wants. Both of them are still on the hook for parts of this. And so the IMF, get this, they come out and they said, listen, we have a plan. And under our plan, we think Greece could meet the terms of paying back its debt. Here's term one. They don't start paying anything back until the year 2040. Ah. Here's term two. They get until they get to until 2080 to pay back what they currently <laughs> I owe. Saw that, yeah. Term three, <laughs> one and a half percent interest. Wow. Right. Um, but all of that left unsaid for the astute listener is: wait a minute, that works if and only if Greece has the money to pay it back. What did the IMF have to assume? And of course, they had to assume rapid resumption of GDP growth somewhere in there so that Greece can crawl its way out of this. Now, let's remember, the IMF is the perennially Pollyannish organization that every year forecasts Greece is just about to start <laughs> returning to economic growth. It's been doing this every year reliably. Uh, to 40 years from 30. And they were going to only charge him 2% interest on the uh, property. And they weren't even, they were weren't even going to add as delinquencies to the principal and the modification, nothing like that. They were just going to do that. Uh, I told them he should definitely do it uh, because his monthly payment on his home would be less than anything he could rent. However, the uh, problem was he was going through a divorce and the ex-wife 
or soon to be X would never agree to it. So that was the end of that. But it really reminded me of exactly the same thing as the mortgage crisis. But to going on, um, we're going to talk about oil, but I don't think you can really talk about oil without talking about what's happening in uh, Venezuela. Uh, because they're just a little more advanced down the uh, slippery slope than than Greece. Well, indeed, you know, Venezuela is suffering itself from a, a number of self-imposed problems uh, and predicaments as well. And uh, their basic one, which I, I had a wonderful interview with Furful, um, oh, sure. uh, who, you, who you and your listeners are probably familiar with. He hails from Argentina, expatted. He's currently living in, in Spain, Spain. But I got him right. to talk to me about what's going on in Venezuela. And he said, ah, Chris, it's, it, it starts and, and almost ends with corruption. It, it's a corrupt nation. And when corrupt nations uh, get to do what they do, it doesn't matter that, that Venezuela has the second largest stated oil reserves in the world or that they've got abundant natural resources. They, they've got the, all the pieces for something other than the world they're living in. And the world they're living in is in a state of collapse right now, created monster where guess what? If mm -hmm. you bomb people, uh, some of them are going to want to leave the uncertainty and the death and destruction of, of that policy behind. And uh, NATO absolutely is up to its eyebrows in creating the instability in the regions where many of these people yeah. are fleeing. Uh, and of course, not all of them come from Syria. Of course, many people are coming from Afghanistan, which I would include in the NATO disaster list. I would include uh, Pakistan as well. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people from North Africa, Libya, of course, escaping a NATO disaster uh, the rest of them, varying degrees of both NATO-led disasters and ecological and uh, uh, economic uh, sort of migrant status, like wanting to leave areas which are not that supportive uh, for a variety of reasons. So it's it's really, Kerry, I think that this refugee thing is tip of the iceberg, but there's poor Greece struggling at the front lines of it. And one more statistic on Greece, out of 220 billion euros of internal loans held by their banks in the country, at last count, 119 billion of those, more than half, were non-performing loans. So I don't care what kind of pencil or crayon you use. The, it, Greece just doesn't have the math. Doesn't work, period. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work. So the, so the IMF said, not only let's kick the can, but let's put a rocket booster on it and send it out towards the next century. You think <laughs> we could do that? <laughs> hey, well, you know, during the mortgage crisis, I remember this guy who I worked with, he showed me an offer that he had from one of the banks to restructure his, his mortgage. And th what you were describing reminds me almost exactly what the bank offered and they were going to stretch out the term of the loan. Since 2010, uh, 2009, when the, when the crisis started, and they've been so wrong that their forecast in 2010 called for Greece's economy to be 32% bigger than it is this year in 2015, its last year. Right. So they only they only whiffed by a third on that. Uh, on that. And <laughs> they're going to keep whiffing because the austerity is killing Greece. 10,000 businesses closed mm. this year. Mm. Over 250,000 businesses closed since the start of the crisis. It's just getting worse. It's it's just shocking. Uh, Greece, all right, they've always had economic challenges, but there was a vibrancy there, and people, uh, they weren't living on the streets. They're in a major, full-scale, unabated depression right now, Chris. I mean, it's a depression. Half the people are unemployed. They're a huge percentage. Well, even during the Great Depression, uh, we didn't find that the country was also saddled with a huge influx of highly disruptive, highly needy refugees who are bringing a lot of troubles, uh, uh, you know, a lot of need needs and neediness, which, of course, all refugees would have. And they're bringing in culture shock as well. And Greece, of course, is on the front line of that, sticking all the way out into the Mediterranean as it does. It's one of the logical first places for boats to land. And uh, Brussels has said, yeah, thanks. You got to take all those people. Uh, no money for you. Yeah. Why don't you deal with that, too? Oh, that's great. Yeah. So uh, as if they didn't have enough problems already, Chris, they're they're saddled with the refugee, the so-called refugee crisis. Which, again, just to be fair, is almost entirely a, a NATO 